fall, winter, fall, winter, winter, fall. Anyways, whatever it's going to be. So welcome for thanks for joining us, and thank you for being mostly uh, bug free as far as uh, colds and all that. Uh, my name is Pastor Raja, and well, Pastor's not really my name, although that'd be kind of cool if it was. Uh, I'm the teaching pastor here at UCC, and this morning we're going to continue on a series we started off a couple of weeks ago on the idea of prayer called transcendence. Let's recap what we talked about last week. So last week we looked at the idea of a Jewish prayer model. Remember we talked about this idea about um, how what we focus our mind upon, what we focus our attention on is actually what, it actually was what transforms us, right? And, and what that, the idea behind that was looking at this idea of what habits were. So remember we looked at Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit, and we said that basically what habits are are, are are small little things that we do on a consistent basis that actually have unintended consequences or larger implications. And I said to you that really when we think about what prayer is meant to be, there is meant to be this idea of structure for it. Um, the question we looked at is, you know, how did Jewish people pray? Now, one of the things we talk about here at Uptown Community Church is we look at the Bible through a Jewish lens because, again, as we have said before, whatever the Bible is, it was first written to Jewish people. And from there, we Gentiles get to look at it and kind of going, what does it mean? And the early church really kind of was still operating under a Jewish model, which became ultimately Gentile in the second or second and a half uh, century, but it was still in the beginning parts, was still operating under a Jewish model. And so what we looked at, this idea of praying three times a day. So remember we asked the question, and, uh, you know, how does prayer happen? So if I said to you, if I asked you, when do you pray in the day? Or we could change the question to, do you pray in a day? And the reality is, is that it, well, it depends on your schedule. It depends if you have a morning class, you have to be at work early, or, or how busy your schedule is. You got to go to the gym, or you got to do errands and groceries and all that stuff. Oftentimes, we think of spiritual disciplines. When we think about God at all, we give God what's left over from the day, right? So when we think about this idea of prayer, I said to you that when we ask ourselves, when does prayer happen, if we're really honest, we can say it doesn't. It might be a perfunctory, good morning, God, or, you know, bless this food type of a thing, or I'm going to bed now, don't let me die, right? That might be as close as we get to a prayer life, but that's not really what God intended as far as what prayer looks like. And so we looked at this idea of the Jewish prayer model. Remember I said to you that the Jewish people pray three times a day, right? In the morning, they have this, what's called the morning blessing. And I showed you those psalms that they would read in the morning. They have the afternoon blessing. And remember, the afternoon blessing was this idea of stopping yourself midday between 2 and 3 p.m. and just pausing yourself and going, okay, whatever has happened so far, whatever I'm experiencing thus far, let's be reminded that God is with me. And remember, the evening prayer was based upon this idea of, of mercy and repentance. So at the end of the day, we look over our day and we say to God, for all the ways that I've lived my own life, the way that I've chosen my own desires over you, I, I ask for your forgiveness, right? And remember, the Jewish model of prayer comes after the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they, this idea of, of, of structured prayer, it, again, for Western Christianity, this feels very Catholic, right? It feels very liturgical. But what I said to you is that you have to have a structured time for prayer because if you don't, you will not pray. You will not devote time for God. And, 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 and again, when we think about our days, you know, when we wake up in the morning, you look at your day, and I'd, I'd like you to think of it as like a bit of a, a blank canvas. Now, I know that when you wake up in the morning, you all go, this is what I have to do today. But it has not yet been done. It's just potential. Well, prayer is this idea of inviting the potential of God throughout your day in whatever you do. And again, just to recap my definition of prayer, right? Prayer is the consciously and intentionally creating space for God. When I created this uh, definition a number of years ago, I was really thinking about the different parts of prayer that we're going to look at, right? And the conscious part of prayer is the conscious invitation to God into our lives. And again, not that we have to overemphasize this point, we call ourselves Christians. And the very basis of the idea of Christianity is, is this idea of transformation, or at least it's intended to be. Stagnation and apathy are antithetical to what Christianity was supposed to be. Every day, in small or in large ways, we are meant to be changed or transformed closer into Jesus' image. 
So what prayer is meant to be, and we said this as well too, that prayer is a keystone habit. Remember keystone, this idea of the archway and the middle stone being the keystone. Well, I said to you that depending on what your prayer life looks like is what the rest of your spiritual life will look like. Prayer is the first and primary spiritual discipline that affects all other spiritual disciplines. So we're not even getting to the really interesting stuff as well, too, in regards to, you know, moving in the spirit, generosity, uh, fasting, meditation, all the other spiritual disciplines we can talk about. If prayer is not in place, everything else falls apart. Like, it's not even, and I could, I was going to go off on a tangent last week and show you the studies that show how if you don't have prayer in place, how these, all these other spiritual disciplines, all these other developmental parts of Christianity all kind of fall apart. I don't need to, right? Because we all know that prayer is important, but what we don't know is at how to actually get it done. So that's what we talked about last week. This morning we're going to jump off and we're going to go a different direction. Uh, but before we do that, I want to show you an article I came across. And this is the article is entitled, How Should Christians Engage with Culture? This is actually kind of an interesting topic. This is something actually I've been fascinated in for about, 30 years. Yes, I'm that old. And the question I've always asked myself, so my background actually isn't necessarily uh, theology as a pastor, but my background is actually art. I actually enjoy art and painting and drawing. It's actually fun. one of the fun things I get to do at Apple is I'm what's called a creative. I get to teach people how to use some of the Apple products. Well, yesterday I did my first seminar on uh, Procreate. For those of you who do art uh, or digital work, Procreate is a fantastic program. Well, what's interesting, the people I had in my class that showed up, we had this um, older lady, a uh, uh, Mennonite lady, but she's like, like this phenomenal painter. She brought some pictures of her paintings. It's like, it, it, not what you expect. Like, again, we're talking like, you know, beanie on the head kind of Mennonite lady. But her, her paintings were like extraordinary. And we had this other uh, individual there who uh, was more of a digital artist, right, but had never used Procreate. Now, the reason I say that too, that's my background. So teaching this class was really easy for me because my background's art. I love painting, I love drawing, I love sketching, I love all that kind of stuff. So it, it, it's kind of fantastic. But as a Christian who loves art, I've always had a difficulty in understanding how does a Christian engage with art in a world? Because as we know, art is a, a filter that we use to engage the world and, and it can be for the better or for the worse. And it really depends, right? All our media consumption I use media in the most liberal of terms, right? Whether it's television, music, movies, uh, what we, uh, you know, social media, all that. It, it's all a reflection upon our values. And so this article is kind of interesting because it's going to lead us into a, uh, the next section I want to talk about. Uh, but let's take a look at what uh, Dr. James Anderson says. He says this, We need to start with a biblical theology of culture. Culture in its simplest definition is simply what we do with what God has made. It's what human beings do with the created world, the natural world, and the resources that God has given us. And the Bible, of course, has a lot to say about the world and what God has made and what we are to do with the world that God has made. So in our small group, on my small group there on Thursday nights, we're doing a survey of the Old Testament. And so first step is understanding the fall, creation and the fall, because these two metaphors for the world kind of bring to, to light the tensions that we face. So on the one hand, we have what God intended. But on the other hand, we have what humanity has chosen. And these two can either be in harmony or they can be in conflict. Well, what's interesting about that is these two ideas also play out on how we engage culture, right? So what he's saying here basically is, you know, Christians have throughout history looked at culture in, in different ways. And those ways that we look at culture have really uh, consequences with how we think the gospel or the kingdom of heaven, engages with culture. Um, he goes on to say this. Um, I think we want to recognize that culture is a gift from God. It's not something to be feared. It's not something to be inherently opposed. But in fact, culture is a part of the goodness of creation. Now, I like that. Now, the reason I like that is because oftentimes Christianity, and especially today, with uh, Christianity being tainted or polluted, to use a more accurate term, with politics and celebrity and all these other kind of Western ideas. But really, I love what he says here, that, you know, traditionally Christians have been very, like, you know, against culture. But he's saying, like, that's actually a misunderstanding of what God intended for culture. We need to recognize that culture is fallen. As well as the doctrine of creation, of course, Christianity has a doctrine of the fall, that the world has fallen into sin. So again, beauty. 
right? These ideas of, 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 of wonder and, and, and inspiration, right? Whether it's musical, whether it's, whether it's media, whatever it might be, these are, like, these are parts of what God has given us. But of course, the world has fallen. And because the world has fallen, it takes these beautiful gifts that God has given us and it twists it to reflect a more, <laughs> I don't know what a word to say there, just a more uh, Western, uh, I don't know, sinful way of looking at it, right? Uh, finally, he says this, I think we need to recognize that all culture is religious in nature because all culture reflects some sort of value system. And that's really what's kind of important here. We think of culture, what we need to understand is it doesn't matter what culture says, what really matters is what values we bring into culture with us. And that's kind of where I want to kind of use it. Finally, he says this. We need to recognize that we ourselves as Christians are part of the culture. So we can't separate ourselves from culture. We can't isolate ourselves from culture. We are affected by the culture around us. And we also affect the culture around us for better or for worse. So every day when you go to school, every day when you go to work, every day when you interact with your friends, your family, uh, whoever it might be, you are affected, and I would like to use the word infected, by culture. Affected, infected. Because that's what culture is. And so really when you look at this idea of culture, there's kind of two concepts where you kind of look at it, right? Traditionally, culture has been us versus them. Right? I grew up, I grew up in the 80s. I wouldn't say the greatest decade, but I'd say pretty, you know, second greatest decade. Uh, but the 80s was, was very interesting because of what the 80s taught us as Christians was we could embrace the mechanisms of culture to help inflate the beauty of the gospel. And I, I use that kind of tongue-in-cheek and also in great sadness. But the 80s were this idea of like, you see, you don't remember this and you don't know this. But when I was in church, they put the drums on the stage. That wrecked people's theology of worship. Like, how could you put drums on the stage? So what was interesting is one Sunday, they put the drums on the stage. It was the center, and a lot of uh, gerfuffle happened behind the scenes. So the drums were moved off stage and had a little bit of blinders around it, right? And then one Sunday, there's this guy playing an electric guitar on stage. And I was like, what? You can have electric Like, see... You guys are, you know, you're so young and you're so cool and you're so hip. But some of us who might be a little bit older, we remember the kind of this, 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 this transformation from organ and piano music and worship to other means of worship, of, of, in, of instruments. And again, it doesn't really matter. But the back of the 80s was an exciting, terrifying time. And we used to have, my youth group, oh my goodness, we used to have people come into our youth group on a consistent basis telling us how evil, you know, secular music was. And that there's hidden music, uh, hidden messages, and there's like back masking. And if you listen to the Beatles album, you're gonna you're gonna become you know like weird and funky and hippie and whatever. And so you know, and and there might be a wonderful lentil recipe in the background as well. I don't know, right? But we had people come to our youth group, and I remember one youth group where we were encouraged to bring our vinyl and a tracks, if you can believe that, uh, you know, secular music to the church, and we're gonna burn them. You joke, you laugh, but that was a thing. You brought your secular music and we're burning it to show how different we are from the culture. And again, I understand, well, I understand, I don't agree. I understand the idea. See, I was the kid, before we burned the music, I'd go pick through stuff I wanted. Right, oh, Simon Garfunkel, I'll take that. Oh, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, I'll grab that. And then, oh yeah, the rest of it I don't like because I don't like the music, period, right? So I was, I was that kid, right? So the idea simply was is that we had an us versus them with culture. But I would say to you, a kind of a newer phenomenon with Christians is us becoming them. And that is the idea that whatever Christianity was supposed to be, there is this idea that we are now becoming more and more like culture. And, and what I mean by that is if you put a Christian in the workplace or in school and you put somebody who's, you know, whatever, atheist or whatever, they don't look all that different in speech and behavior in, in, in what they consume as far as media goes, how they use their resources. There's very little difference, right? And so what happens is, is that we are now faced with this idea, is it us versus them? Is it us becoming them? But I think there is a third option. That's the good news, right? But the third option is going to bring us to our next um, conversation about prayer. And what we're going to look at this morning is, how did Jesus pray? Right? So we look at the Jewish model, 
And remember, Jesus is going to take the Jewish model, but he's going to add something to it, which is going to kind of help us to understand the next step of a vibrant prayer life. So prayer is one of the most effective tools for engaging the culture because it is dependent on God's action. So what's interesting about prayer is, is that if you have a, uh, I'll use the phrase, I'll use the word robust. If you have a robust prayer life, you are going to effectively engage culture. Now, when I say you're going to effectively engage culture, does that mean you're going you're to change culture? No. Does that mean you're going to change people around you? Not necessarily. So how exactly is an effective prayer life actually going to change culture? It's a good question. I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to kind of sit through the rest of the sermon to kind of get there. Um, John Cyril says this, and I think this is kind of interesting. For us, the educated members of society, the world has become demystified. Or rather, to put, the more, to put the point more precisely, we no longer take the mysteries we see in the world as expressions of supernatural meaning. We no longer think of odd occurrences as cases of God performing speech acts in the language of miracle. If the supernatural existed, it would have to be natural. Now, what I, the reason I want to interject this in here is when we talk about prayers, we talk about robust prayer life, and we look at the life of Jesus, one of the things we have to have wholly firmed in, you know, firmly planted in our mind is prayer is a supernatural act. Christianity is a supernatural relationship. Above everything else we talk about with Christianity as far as behavioral, about being a good person and all that kind of other stuff, at the core, Christianity is supernatural. Prayer is an extension of that supernatural relationship. When I pray, when I find myself in a consistent prayer life, I'm always surprised by the coincidences that I see in my life. Of people I run into, of conversations that seem to pop up, of, of things that I get pulled into. I'm always amazed at how coincidental things are. But I would say to you that coincidences are kind of the language of God. It's kind of the language of miracles. It's kind of the language of our alignment, or I would say our realignment with the su supernatural realm, whom the God we serve is Lord of all things. So when I'm saying to you that prayer life is the best way to engage culture, I'm not saying to you that by praying, we're going to elect Christian politicians. I'm not even sure if that oxymoron exists. Or somehow we're going to have a celebrity that's going to become a Christian, because that never worked out well for us. Like, like, like when we talk about engaging culture, what you're going to find is that prayer is an effective tool, but not in the way that you understand it. And Jesus is going to teach us what that looks like, but not the, not the way that we think. Um, we talk about Christ's likeness, but we forget about the discipline and focus Jesus had on prayer. So what's interesting is that we talk about saying, like, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means to be like Jesus. Fair enough. But what does that actually mean? Right? Well, what does that actually mean to be like Jesus? Does that mean to like grow a beard, carry a, a lamb around you, and wear like a bathrobe all day long? Is, is that what it means to be like Jesus? Like, is, 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 is that what we think of when we think of Jesus? And it, 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 you know, it might be. But the fact is, like, we, want, we talk about Christ's likeness, then we need to ask ourselves, what did Jesus do in his actual daily life? Well, the good news is the Gospels kind of give us a pretty good picture of what Jesus did. And what's interesting is you look at all four Gospels, one of the things that the Gospel writers, the, you know, all four of them, and I remember, of the Gospel writers, only Matthew and Mark and John are actually, well, actually, so only Matthew and John are eyewitness accounts. Mark is Peter's disciple, so it's Peter's recounting of, the, of Jesus. And Luke is not even a disciple at all. So we have four biographies of Jesus, two are first-hand accounts, two are second-hand accounts. So we get a pretty in detailed, robust look at the life of Jesus. But what's interesting is if you were to look at Jesus' life in all four Gospels, one topic tends to come to the top, how Jesus prayed. And so that's what I want to look at this morning, because if, I, if we keep talking about, like, let's be like Jesus, we have to first see what did actually Jesus do. So the three years we're going to cover. First one is... Jesus prayed as a discipline, and we're going to look at it briefly, but basically Jesus prayed the Jewish prayer calendar, and I'm going to show you that in Scripture. But the second thing you're going to notice about how Jesus does is that he actually prays as preparation, and I'll unpack for you what that means. And the third thing we're going to look at with Jesus is that Jesus prayed as he encountered need. Now, um, Henry and Richard Blackaby said this, 
The life of Jesus provides the model for our prayer lives. God is seeking to mold us into the image of his son. If we are to act like Christ, our prayer lives must be conformed to his. Many Christians are unwilling to pay the price that Jesus paid when it comes to interceding with God. Jesus' prayers came with a vehement cries and tears because of his godly fear. He was heard by the Father. See, I guarantee you, if I was to ask each and every one of you of things that you want to see happen in your life for God, you'd give me a list of like at least four or five things, if not more. The top of the list, I would imagine, would be people in your lives who are not yet Christ followers that you would like for them to encounter Jesus. The second thing on your list might be um, you're in your own personal life. Maybe it's, it's sins you want to overcome or habitual sins or, or things in your own life that you're working through. And, and again, the list would go on from there. But what's interesting is, is we have all these things that we want God to accomplish, but we, we don't really invest any kind of energy or effort into it. And that's where it's kind of, there's this disconnect, right? And remember we talked about last, a couple weeks ago, I said to you that for many years, I felt that I was a spectator on my own spiritual development, that I just go through life, and that one day a burning bush would appear, and God would say, hey, this is what I want you to do. I'm like, oh, okay, there you go, God, there you are, and now I'll do what you ask me to do. But instead, what God wants to do is he wants to invite me as a partner into the spiritual journey that he's placed me upon. He has his part, but guess what? I have my part as well. And that's really what Jesus is going to show us in regards to what a, a spiritual life, a robust spiritual life looks like. So let's take a look here about the Jewish practices, right? So what's interesting is in Scripture, and I'm only going to give you a few examples, is that we see time and time again is that in the early morning, Jesus goes off by himself to pray. Now remember, this is a very Jewish thing to do, right? This is, this is exactly what the Jewish people did. The, the rabbis, the disciples, Judaism teaches in the morning we go away for prayer. Now remember I said to you, it's a very Western idea to make your prayers up. The Jewish people didn't do that. What they would do is they would pray through the Psalms. And remember last week I gave you five Psalms. These are what's called the morning blessing Psalms for you to read through. And by the way, if you weren't here last week and you'd like to have them, th my notes are online as well too. But the point simply is, is that Jesus goes away. He prays the Psalms, but he just prays. He, s he takes time out of his morning to focus himself for the day. We go, oh, okay, that makes sense. We see throughout the day as well, too, that Jesus does the afternoon prayer. Now, one interesting one is in uh, Mark's gospel, where he actually gives us the time of the afternoon prayer. Now, why I find that kind of interesting is this is Jesus upon the cross. This is not kind of the area that you would expect for, you know, Jesus to do the afternoon prayer. But this is why in Mark's gospel, Peter's gospel, he has this note at three in the afternoon. Remember I said to you, whenever the Bible points out a particular detail, it's for a reason. Because the writer is assuming the reader understands what's happening. To the Jewish person, when they read this, they go, oh, Jesus is praying the, the afternoon prayer. And what does Jesus pray in the afternoon prayer? Eli, Eli, Laman, Bax, the Saptomini, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. Jesus from the cross is praying Psalm 22, which is a very Jewish thing to do. The Jewish readers go, knows exactly what's happening. Now, it's no coincidence that Jesus picks Psalm 22 because Psalm 22 is about him, right? It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a reenactment thousands of years before of exactly what's happening to Jesus. It's a prophetic psalm that Jesus is praying from the cross, but again, in three in the afternoon. Now, I want you to see something here in Acts chapter three. Look what the writer says. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. When? Three in the afternoon. Remember I said to you that the early church just adopts the Jewish model of prayer and continues with it for the first 100, 150 years because, again, the early church predominantly is Jewish. But the Gentiles come along going, you know what, we're just going to adopt these Jewish practices. So this is why it's important to understand that at 3 in the afternoon, I said between 2 and 3 in the afternoon, it was the time of prayer, and Jesus took time out of his day in the early afternoon to pray. And, of course, in the evening prayers. Once again, Jesus in the evening goes off by himself. Time and time again, it's recorded. As he leaves the disciples, or he does his teaching, he does his miracles, he goes off and he prays. Now, why is this important? This is important because Jesus is God. First of all, does Jesus even need to pray? That's a philosophical conundrum. I don't even know if I want to wrap my mind around, but he does. Because what does he know? He knows that his disciples 
are watching him. So he does what he expects them to do, but wants them to understand. Remember what Jesus says. I didn't come here to destroy the Jewish law. I came to fulfill it. But in fulfilling it, he still shows that he still submits himself to it. So three times a day, Jesus goes off and pray. Morning, afternoon, and evening. So Jesus adopts the, uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish model of prayer. But the second part here as well, too, is Jesus prays as, as, as preparation as well. So Jesus uses the, fr- the framework for his model, but he goes beyond this as well, too. Now, this is where we get the, kind of, we get the transition between the J- Judaism, the Jewish model now, to more of a, uh, a fluid model. Now, Jesus prays as preparation. Now, here's what I need to understand. There are certain times in Jesus' ministry where he knew that things were about to happen, that he needs to devote more time in prayer because this is kind of like a pivotal point, right? So the first time is Luke chapter 4, right? What's happened in Luke chapter 4? Well, he's been in the desert for 40 days, right? He's been fasting. He's been praying. Why? What's ha- what happens at the end of his time of prayer? Well, the enemy shows up. And just so you know, in uh, Dante's Inferno, the, the temptation of Christ is set in Dante's envision of it in the garden because Dante sees this as garden part two. Right? The first Adam falls. In Dante's understanding of it, it's, it's, it's a second Adam now versus the enemy. The first Adam falls. The second Adam does not. Now, the reason why it's interesting is, is because after this, Jesus comes out in the power of the Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. So what, what does Jesus do here? He's full of the Spirit. He goes away for 40 days because he's got a showdown. Right? He's got a showdown with the enemy. What happens in uh, Luke chapter 6? One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. So what's happening here? Well, just so you know, Jesus didn't actually just have 12 disciples. He actually had 72, and he actually had more than that, people who wanted to be. Because you know what? Jesus is like a celebrity at this point in time. He's going around. He's doing miracles. Thousands of people you know, keep coming to him. By the way, Jesus is a horrible megachurch pastor because every time that people come to him, he kind of sends them away. And he, he doesn't really take up a good offering either. Okay? And he doesn't have any merch or swag. He, he definitely needs to have that, right? And his Jewish Twitter handle is just a mess, right? So like, like he's not really a great megachurch pastor, right? But what he does have are people around him. So whenever there's a crowd, people are like, hey, I don't know about this Jewish guy, but I definitely like to be part of this crowd. But what does Jesus do? He goes away and he prays all night long And he comes, and what does he do? He chooses the 12, the 12 that we know, who would be his representatives. Now, what they don't know is the 12 that he chooses are the 12 who are going to die for him. Right? He's going to choose the 12, and of the 12, 11 of them are going to die pretty horrible deaths. And the last one wishes he had died in a horrible death because he's the last one, John, on the Isle of Patmos. So 11 out of 12. Jesus chose him. Well, there's one of those 12 that also died a horrible death, but not because of martyrdom, but that's a whole different, that's a whole Easter conversation that we'll get, we'll get to that later. You get the point though, right? But why does Jesus do this? Isn't Jesus God? Fun fact, in Jesus' three-year ministry, Jesus sets aside his divinity. It's a whole kenosis slash, you know, emptying of himself idea. And he relies fully upon the Holy Spirit. That's why Luke's gospel is more gospel about the Holy Spirit than it is about Jesus. Because time and time again, if you look at Luke's gospel and you look at how many times Luke talks about the Holy Spirit, it's all about Jesus and his his life in the Spirit. So Jesus goes away all night long to pray because the decision he wants to make, he wants to make the right one. And again, the inner battle in my mind of like, well, doesn't he just God? Doesn't he just know? I, I don't know, right? But the point is he goes away all night long to pray and he chooses the twelve. When's the last time as well, too? The Garden of Gethsemane. What did he say to his disciples? Stay here. I'm going over there to pray. Why? The cross is coming. Right? The cross is coming. Jesus prayed as preparation. Now, Jesus also prayed as response to need. Now, here's what I mean by this. One of the things we see in the life of Jesus is everywhere Jesus went, people wanted something from him. And these are just a couple examples. Literally, I could... I could just give you the four Gospels pretty much because almost every one of them has account after account of, of people asking Jesus, 
you know, so and so is demon possessed. Uh, my son, my daughter is is dead. Uh, you know, I need to be healed. Uh, you know, and again, all and on and on. Right? Jesus was encountering need everywhere he went. But what's interesting about Jesus, though, is that he doesn't just go out and kind of rock and roll it, like, "Hey, I'm Jesus" kind of thing. But it's like this 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 real foundation of spending time with the Father living in the empowerment of the Spirit, was part and parcel to his ministry. And we see this time and time again. Now, let me kind of break this down to you. Because there's one part I haven't talked about yet, and we're going to get to it. One of the most misunderstood moments in the Jesus teaching is found in the Lord's Prayer. So what's interesting is, whenever you study the prayer in the life of Jesus, the Lord's Prayer pops up at the front and center. But I'm going to say something to you this morning. Because I had a bit of an aha moment this week. I think we've been approaching this all wrong. I know, that's a bold statement. But I think we've approached the Lord's Prayer in an incorrect way because there's, there's something wrong with the Lord's Prayer. Our understanding of the Lord's Prayer, nothing wrong with the Lord's Prayer. I know, I'm, I'm saying this and you look at me like, what is he talking about? Um, a guy named Jeffrey Kurz, uh, he was the guy that actually kind of turned me on a little bit to this. He says this, the Lord's Prayer is known almost by everyone. It's the most famous prayer, but, but despite the commonality of this prayer, we often miss the true beauty and depth found in the meaning of the Lord's Prayer. Perhaps we know it a little too well. So when I say to you Lord's Prayer, this is what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll use Matthew's version of it, right? And I'm using the NIV because, I don't know, I grew up on the NIV, and it just, it just feels a little bit more holy to me, not that it actually is, but it says this. And I'm saying this. You can repeat it along with me if you want, right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, in your head, you're going, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, right? That's not actually in it, right? That's actually, an, that's actually added on in the Middle Ages. It's part of a, a, a benediction, right? This is the Lord's Prayer. Now, what's interesting about this, and let me, let me put this into context here. Right before Jesus teaches this prayer, look what he says to his disciples. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because there are many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This kind of feels like a funny thing to say right before he teaches them to pray, doesn't it? The word babbling there in the Greek, just a, fun, a little fun little fact, is repetition. Babbling is this idea of babies. You know, go, right? And your baby's like, right? It, it mimics it back to you, right? But the interesting thing about it, don't get caught up on me going, you, 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 you've all done it, right? <laughs> I'm just thinking about people watching this on video later on uh, or listening to via podcast. Anyways, um, the mimicking of the baby is mimicking the behavior without understanding what you're doing, although I don't know if they could actually drive a great deal of meaning out of it. But that's what babbling means. So Jesus is going to supposedly teach his disciples to pray. But does it almost feel like it's kind of weird that Jesus would put this right before he teaches them how to pray? Oh, when you pray, don't repeat meaningless words. Oh, and here's some meaningless words for you to repeat. Huh. Okay, let me show you something else. Uh, for you skeptics who think I'm still off, off my rocker here. In Luke's version... When Luke brings up the Lord's Prayer, right before this is the story of Mary and Martha. The story of Mary and Martha is fantastic, right? Because you know this, right? It's, 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 it's Martha and Mary, right? The disciples come to their home, right? And, 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 and they're both, the, both the sisters are kind of choosing two paths. One chooses to prepare food for these 12 vagabonds that just show up at their house unannounced, right? They have to get the Jewish Uber Eats to come in, you know, drop off some food type of thing. While the other decides, you know what? I'm going to sit at Jesus' feet and listen to him. By the way, the image that they use there is of a disciple. Sitting at someone's feet is a Jewish term for rabbis. Disciples did that. Now, why this is interesting is that Martha is, gonna, is so worried about one thing, right? But she says, Lord, why aren't you telling my sister to come help me in the kitchen? Now, there's gender roles here. There's all sorts of things. But what I think is really core about this is what Jesus says, right? Right? Is, is Mary has chosen what is better, 
right? So right before Jesus teaches on prayer, this is the story that Luke chooses to kind of frame the next part here. And then in Luke uh, 11, verse 1, it says this, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So what I find interesting about this, the secondary phrase to this, is he just didn't say, hey, Lord, teach us to pray. But it's more of a mimicking of John's disciples. Hey, teach us like John's, John the baptizer is teaching his disciples. Right? And then again, Matthew's gospel. And when you pray, don't be like hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. Hypocrite is from the Greek word hypocrites, which is actor. Right? It's a play actor in a, in a play. Right? What does an actor in a play do? They repeat words that are a, a script that's given to them. Now, why am I telling you all this? When we think of the Lord's Prayer, we think these are words we're meant to repeat. Now, I will show you in a second, there's tons of deep meaning in this prayer, for sure. I'm not telling you for a second that, oh, you should just dismiss it. I am saying to you, however, that there's a piece of this that when I kind of started rethinking this, I've realized there's something missing here, right? So if I said to you, Hey, um, can you teach me how to whatever it is that you do, right? So if you came to me, hey, teach me how to make uh, a, a recipe, right? Because I like to cook. If, then I if I then turned around and just gave you the dish and said, hey, enjoy it, did I actually teach you how to do it? No. I'm actually asking you to enjoy the dish. And so you would say to me, well, how did you do it? And I would say to you, well, how is that as important as the end result? When Jesus, the disciples say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, teach us how to pray. He, he gives them this idea, what we just read there. But what's interesting is he actually doesn't teach them to pray as much as he does something else. And what I, the something else is what I want to really kind of, um, kind of emphasize to you. He shows them what a life looks like of a person who prays consistently. If you go back, and we're, we're going to do this in a second, is that the Lord's Prayer is not so much a prayer as it is, hey, this is what you should do. Step one, step two, step three. It's in fact more behaviors of a person who has a consistent prayer life. Now, let me show you something here. Matthew 6, 9 to 13. It's the Lord's Prayer, which is what we just read a second ago. <clears throat> this is not what Jesus is asking to repeat. Because he just says, don't babble and don't be like actors. So the idea is that he's not asking them to repeat these words as if they're magical, as if these words themselves have some sort of, like, this is what you should do every time. This is your template for prayer. Because, again, what's interesting is we have re prayers recorded in the book of Acts. We have other prayers recorded. Nobody repeats this. That should be your first indicator that something else is going on here. So what's interesting is, as I went through this, kind of line by line, and I realized something here. These aren't prayers as much as they are behaviors. So it's almost as if Jesus is answering their question by not answering their question, by answering the real question that they're asking them. What's the real question that Jesus they're asking him? Jesus, how do we be like you? Right? Because they're not asking Jesus about how to pray because they, that wasn't even the question. The question was, teach us to pray like John the baptizer teaches his disciples. Sorry, it's really dry in here. <clears throat> and I'm talking a lot. You're like, no, duh, we're here too. Um, so when you think about this, that's the part that I found kind of interesting is when I looked at this, I realized something. Jesus actually doesn't teach them how to pray, but he actually shows them our behaviors of somebody who has a consistent prayer life. And that was, a, that was the aha moment for me. Because Jesus isn't saying, hey, repeat these words on a daily basis. He's saying, if you pray consistently, if you have a robust prayer life, this is what you're going to look like. This is how you will act and live in the real world. Whatever that looks like to you. So, <clears throat> Lord, don't teach us to pray. Teach us to live. Right? It's... It, it's not so much a prayer, but a beautiful image of what a prayerful life looks like. When I, um, 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. I'm, remember, I'm I'm thinking this moment right now. I'm about to tell you. So when I was first a youth pastor, I made some pretty stupid mistakes. One mistake that I made was uh, I, I I love young adult ministry. I've always loved young adult ministry. And so one of my first churches that I was a pastor at, um, we didn't have a lot of young adults showing up. As a matter of fact, we had like we had like maybe like six young adults and three of them were like 40-year-olds and we're not really a good definition of young adults. So I thought, you know what? Let's do something that young adults actually like to do. So in the town of, uh, of Belleville, there was, a, uh, there was a pool hall. And so I decided, you know what would be kind of fun? You know what would be get young adults out? I'm going to rent the pool hall out. And I'm going to say, hey, young adults, come on out. We're going to play pool. By the way, for Pentecostals, that's a big no-no. <clears throat> I didn't know that. Uh, well, I did. Well, uh, that's a different conversation, right? But I just, I just wanted young adults to come out because they're all they're, they're like hiding out in the forest apparently, or something like that. Because they just they wouldn't come out to uh, you know we'd have worship nights they didn't show up, right? So we did this young adult night, and um, <laughs> uh, shortly thereafter we had our annual uh, church business meeting. And I'm sitting there as a youth pastor at this business meeting. Just so you know, youth pastors at business meetings, we just can't stand it because there's nothing about that. Really, nobody cares about youth ministry, right? Like, it's just like, you know, we, our, 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 you know is the roof up okay? Or, you know, is the, is the church clean? Or, you know, whatever, the budgets and all that. Nobody cares about youth ministry. So I wasn't really paying attention. Should not come as any shock to any of you, right? So I'm sitting there, and, you know, they had these open mics, and people would get up and uh, would talk. And this lady is getting up talking. I'm not paying attention, but then I hear my name. You know, you, you never had a conversation where you're not really listening, but you hear your name, you're like, oh, wait, what? Right? So then all of a sudden, I kind of like, and, and, and so one of the uh, associate pastors elbows me, and like, they're talking about you. I'm like, wait, what? What are they saying about me? Right? You're like, I'm the youth pastor. Nobody cares about me. And she said, and I quote, how dare our youth pastor take our young adults to a den of iniquity rather than having a prayer meeting for them? Or, or having a prayer meeting for, for the young adults. And I was just flabbergasted because we were having like, you know, six young adults show up to any kind of a young adult event that we did. For the pool hall one, we had like close to 60 show up, right? It was wall-to-wall young adults, people who hadn't been out to church in years, and we, were, we had a great time. And just be clear, right? There was, there, it, it, was, it, was, it was absolutely appropriate because we had the entire place to ourselves. It was nothing, nothing untoward happened, even close. Uh, and, and it was a stretch of the imagination. Just play, play, play Paul pool and had chicken wings, which is, again, my love language. And, uh, and that's all we did, right? But I got to know these young adults. I got to know where they are. And the question I was asking them was, hey, haven't seen the church in like, oh, 20 years. Uh, <laughs> where have you been? Like, what's going on? And just wanted to make kind of connection with them, make a relationship with them. That's really what I wanted. And so... She kind of goes after me at this this thing, and again, I understand. I like, you know, like you, you would think that I'd get angry. I'm not. I I, I actually started kind of laughing. Um, so I get up to the mic and I said, "Listen, I understand. One of the cop outs Christians can have is, hey, I'm going to pray for you. Right? A tragedy happens in the world. I'm praying for them. Oh, I know it's getting uncomfortable, right? Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm going to pray for you. Or oh yeah, oh yeah, that's like it's it's this idea we have in our minds that we can somehow say we're praying for somebody or actually being prayerful about somebody, but we actually don't do anything about it. And so I get up to the mic, and uh, I wish I could say to you that I, w- I was kind and gracious. Um, I, I I think I was. I was more shocked at that moment in time, and I just simply said, like I you know I appreciate that that you know in the past. You know, having a prayer meeting for this group is not a bad idea, and I and I encourage everybody to. And you want to have a prayer meeting for young adults? I will show up, no problem. I was never invited to a prayer meeting after that. But um, but I say, but what I think is more important is actually going out to where the people are, and being prayerful amongst them. What I find interesting about Jesus's uh, prayer when he teaches disciples to pray is when I actually looked at it in this light, it wasn't about these are the words you should repeat. But if you are living a robust prayer life, this is what you look like. Do you see the difference? Right? Because the Lord's Prayer has always been this, hey, repeat after me, or, or you know, at funerals for some reason, we, people recite the Lord's Prayer, and I always found that kind of odd. It's also when people sing Amazing Grace as well, too, because I don't want to say to people, but it's kind of too late. But anyways, um, but what's interesting is that, like, when I look at Jesus' prayer, you know, our Father, who art in heaven, holy, hallowed is your name. Your kingdom come. 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's it. it there's not a lot of like, hey, when you pray, uh, make sure you talk to God and make sure you ask for things you want and make sure, you know, you know, all these things. These are what I would do when I'm teaching to pray. And I'm, next week, as we wrap the series up, I'm actually going to teach you how to pray. But what Jesus is actually saying is, listen, somebody who thinks about the kingdom of heaven, somebody who exists as an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, this is what their life looks like. This is how they behave. This is how they live in a world that desperately needs to see it. And I think we as Christians may have kind of forgotten this a little bit in the sense that like, we have the belief part that we think that prayer is important, but we don't have the behavior part of actually praying. And if I could take it even a step further, the next part after the belief and the behavior is then living as if God has heard your prayer. So when I look back on, on Jesus' model of prayer, because I'm kind of, my mind's more of a literal mind, it looks like this. Step one is we have a discipline of prayer. Step two is we have preparation for the known. Remember I said to you that when Jesus had to make big decisions, he would take time to pray? I don't know if any of you have any big decisions coming up, but I guarantee you, immersing those decisions in prayer might be the best thing you do. But what about the stuff you don't know? Well, guess what? Step one and step two prepare you for step three. Right? So, have you ever been in a situation where you think to yourself, man, I just, you know, I just really need God to intervene right now. I'm having a conversation. I'm hearing something. Something's going on. And I just wish God would intervene. How different would that question be is if, if you had in that morning spent time with the Lord? You had spent time or, or created space for God in your life. So that when you're coming to this conversation, you're coming to this encounter, you're coming to this moment, and you're like, you're not feeling the, l the lack of God, but instead you are feeling the abundance of God. Do you see how we kind of change, we reframe the situation? See, when Jesus goes out into the world, he doesn't go out into the world saying, hey, I'm Jesus, I can do everything. He goes out into the world with a very firmly Jewish prayer model in his life. He goes out into the world saying, listen, I know these big decisions are coming, I'm going to immerse them in prayer. And for all the stuff he doesn't know, he's prepared, why? Because his prayer life reflects that. And the end result is, coming back to where we started off with, prayer is the most effective way to engage culture. Why? It's God's kingdom, God's will. See, I don't know what my prayers do in the world, but I'm kind of glad I don't. Because I pray for you, I pray for others, I pray for UCC, I pray for, I, I have things I pray for. But I got a confession to you. I sometimes don't know how effective those prayers are. I, I don't know. But what's interesting is, is I'm not living as if God's not listening to the prayers. I'm said being faithful to know that God is listening to the prayers. And in turn, what I'm doing is, is I'm having that model of prayer. I'm having the model of preparation. And for all the stuff that I don't know, I'm just giving it to God so that his kingdom come his will be done. It's the behaviors that kind of play out from the beliefs that we have here. Prayer as Jesus models it is about a life lived in the light of the invited presence of God. Remember my definition of prayer? I know that each and every one of you, you live in the real world. Whatever that looks like for you, whatever context that might be for you. And you want something about the real world? It doesn't really play by God's rules. It doesn't, like, there isn't uh, uh, someone around you might be even other. You might be the only Christian in your friend group, in your classroom, in your workplace. Right? And when I say not playing by the rules, you, you are alone when you're trying to have conversations of faith, of different values. The world says one thing and you're like, Wah. you know, and someone asks you, hey, how do you think? I've been having these conversations, like, a ton over the last little bit. Remember I said to you, there's no coincidences? I've been having these conversations with people in, in the most weird, <laughs> random ways. Right? What do Christians think? Hey, you're a pastor. All right, let's have a conversation. I, 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 had this I was having this conversation with somebody about, uh, 
all you know, you you Christians all pretty much believe the same thing, right? You just you know, all all religions are the same. I love that that one. I'm like, oh really? Let's talk about that. Right? But the point simply is this is as I have real when I look at the life of Jesus, I realize it wasn't haphazard. It wasn't like, ah, oh, what's gonna happen? He's intentional about his time with God. He's intentional about the stuff that he knows and needs to get done. But then he's prepared for the unknown stuff. Right? He's, he's ready. Why? Because he's already spent time with God. He's already created space on his daily canvas for God's presence. And so when he goes out into the world, he's not worried that he's, he's, he's unprepared. He's fully prepared. And fully prepared doesn't mean for you that you know what the answer is. You don't know the outcome. You know what's going to happen. Fully prepared is, oh, hi, here, let me show you what fully prepared looks like. Oh, last slide. <clears throat> it's not really traditionally thought of as a, as, as, a, uh, as a prayer, but I've been thinking about this verse a lot in regards to Jesus' prayer life. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a, pra- uh, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. This may not seem like a, like a model of Jesus' a prayer, but this is something I've been thinking about a lot. As I go out into the world, as I encounter different people, as I encounter different needs, to be the most effective, to be the most fruitful, to use the verse analogy, I need to remain in Jesus. First thing when I wake up in the morning, I need to acknowledge God's presence. I need to invite his presence to my daily life. I need to say to God, Lord, for this day, help me to set aside my agenda if your agenda is more important. Help me to see you in the people I encounter. Help me to love the people I encounter as you love them. Because some of the people I encounter are jerks but help me to love them as you would love them. My mid-afternoon prayer. Lord, I just want to remember that in the craziness of my day, in the stuff that I've, that I've experienced already, you are with me. And as I go to bed at night, Lord, for the ways that I have chosen my will over thy will, my kingdom over thy kingdom, forgive me. Be merciful to me. And tomorrow morning we'll try it again. And in that structure of prayer, in the ideas of, of preparation, and there's, there's things in my life right now that I'm preparing for, I'm immersing those in prayer as well. But for the unknown stuff that I don't know about, well, by the way, that's very definition of unknown stuff, I am in you. I'm remaining in you. I am remaining in your spirit. I'm remaining in your presence. And sometimes all that means is I gotta focus in on you as I'm out doing whatever I'm doing. That's it. Lord, let me remain in you. That's my prayer. That's my prayer life. That's my that's my Lord's prayer. As I want to remain in Christ. I want the Spirit to, to focus me in on Jesus. Because I encounter <laughs> such stuff during my days that I just need the Lord in there. Jesus' model of prayer starts off with the Jewish model, but goes a little bit further. And next week, we're going to see we're going to see how the Spirit, what He does next on that. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Remember, we just do this for meditation. <clears throat> we do this upon reflection. You're seeing, you're hearing a lot of emphasis on a structure of prayer. And that's intentional. Before we can get to the good stuff of Jesus' life, before we get to the behavioral parts, before we get to the miraculous parts, there has to be a discipline of prayer. You have to remain in Jesus. You cannot be fruitful if you're not in Christ. But there's other parts of your life as well too. Some of you have some decisions in your life. Some of you have some um, forks in the road, per se. You need to immerse that with prayer as well, too. You need to immerse those decisions in your life, those people in your life, those relationships in your life, in prayer. Because if you don't, 
<coughs> you want that to be fruitful? And finally, the unknown. I think it was Shakespeare who said, the unknown is God's country. It's easy to prepare for the stuff we know. It's vastly different for the stuff we don't know. That's the realm of the spirit. Ultimately, it's thy will be done, thy kingdom come. <coughs> Dear Lord, <coughs> I thank you that you modeled a realistic prayer life for us. Oftentimes I think that I need to be prayer 24-7. I need to be super spiritual, whatever that even means. But instead, you show us that it's just about the intentionality, the focus on you, that we get to change the world. <coughs> Not as we would say, but as you would say. Be with us in this, in Jesus' name. <coughs>